Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not faint. Father, I thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we can rest in your immutability, and we ask in this hour as we open your word that you would renew our minds with the truth of who you are, because you've told us you've given us this book that we not might only be saved, but that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. I pray for all those who will hear this message that your blessing would be over it, I ask this Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, anoint me and use me. Help me to lift up Christ. You promised that you would draw all men to yourself. You are the one who convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. May your ministry be in our presence today. May we take this truth and not just as hearers of the word of God, but those who would obey it and apply it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take God's word this morning, would you, and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. If you're new to the Bible, if you will just find the book of Revelation and scan backwards a little bit, you will soon come to Hebrews. Now, if you've been here a few times, you know that you need a Bible to follow the sermons. You'll get much more out of the scripture if you actually have a written copy. And if you don't have one, come to meet the pastor in courtesy of a family, you will receive one. And it's good to mark the Bible up. It will help you to internalize some of its truths. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the God who gave us the Bible. And we hold in our hands 66 inerrant, inspired books. There's not a single mistake in Holy Scripture. And God gave it to us not to make us smarter sinners, but to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you are here for the first time, I usually take a book of the Bible, go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I've been doing a special series called God's Prophetic Schedule, but we are departing for this week only. God willing, we'll be back next week because this series has generated a question that I've been asked a number of times, and that is, how do people in the Old Testament get saved? And that's an important question, and to help us to answer that, We want to look at this man by the name of Abraham who lived 2,000 years before Jesus came to the earth. He is the quintessential example of a man of faith. And he affirms that God has only one way of saving us, and that is by his Messiah. He's the chief of all the Old Testament believers. He's described in Scripture as the father of the faithful, the father of us all. And he's also dubbed three times in Scripture the friend of God. Now, obviously, if he is the friend of God, then he's a perfect example of how to have a genuine relationship with God. And we would do well to pay attention to his life. You say, well, is that a title that only Abraham can have? Actually not. Jesus said in John 15 that he would lay down his life for his friends, not dealing with the extent of the atonement, but the intent of the atonement. And then he'll say in that same chapter, no longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. And so the question is, how did Abraham become God's friend and how can we become God's friend as well? And what's true regarding the relationship of the father of all who believe would certainly be true of us. And of course, the book of Hebrews is written not only to help people to know how to be saved, but then how to continue that walk of faith. Now, let me set the context for you. Uh, Hebrews is not an easy book. It's one of the more challenging books in all of the New Testament. So let me begin with the broad context. This is a chart God gave me many, many years ago when I preached the book some 30 years ago. Here's an overview. Chapters one through four deal with the worth of Christ. The focus is on the deity and humanity of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, if you study that section well, it will help you to defend those who attack his deity or his humanity. Then in chapters 5 through 10, the focus is on the work of Christ. 
And this letter will help you to grow in your understanding of your salvation. You can know enough of the cross to be born again, but books like Romans are written to save people so that they can deepen and broaden their understanding of the cross that their roots might go deep. Hebrews is the same. And then when you come to chapters 11 to 13, the focus is on the walk of the Christian. Or to say it differently, chapters 1 through 10 deal with instruction, chapters 11 through 13 with exhortation. The first 10 chapters instruct us on what we are to believe, the last three chapters as to how we are to behave. Because God knows that our belief should influence our behavior, that our position in Christ should indeed influence our practice for Christ. Doctrine always leads to duty. God doesn't give you doctrinal truth to make you smarter. He makes you, he gives you doctrinal truth to make you more like Christ. The two are always bled together. Ephesians 1 through 3, what we believe. 4 through 6, how we behave. Book after book after book in the Bible will often unfold in that way. Now, the theme of chapter 11 as we zoom in on this chapter is that of faith. He has just recounted maybe some failures of faith in the previous chapter. Now, when he comes to chapter 11, he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then the writer notes here in verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, faith is not peripheral to the purposes of God. It is central to his purposes. You cannot please God without faith. You cannot be saved without faith. And you cannot grow without faith in the exercise thereof. Now, uh, as you come into this chapter, it's interesting because he uh, dips back into Israel's history into five different time periods to help us to see men and women who walked by faith. And uh, you might want to jot out in the margin after the introduction in verses 4 through 7, he deals with the primeval period, the primeval period. That term, the primeval period, refers to Genesis 1 through 11. Technically, it's before Israel has become a nation. He had not yet established the Jewish people as a nation. That unfolds beginning in Genesis, the 12th chapter. So he highlights three great men of faith, three Gentiles. He highlights Abel, he highlights Enoch, and he highlights Noah. Then when you come to uh, verses 8 to 22, the second period in Israel's history is the patriarchal period. And there he deals with the founding fathers of the nation. He begins with Abraham. He continues through Jacob's 12 sons. A total of 15 patriarchs are found in the Bible, but only four make it on the honor roll, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The third period is found in verses 23 through 29, and we typically refer to that as the period of the Exodus. And the one individual who's highlighted apart from his parents is Moses. Moses, who is willing to say no to the passing pleasures of sin. And then the fourth section is found in verses 30 and 31. We typically call that the period of the conquest. And the focus is on Israel as they walk into the promised land, the walls fall down, and by faith they see the land given to them. And of course, uh, they see a prostitute converted as well. And then fifth and finally, in verses 32 to 38, we find the period of the judges and the kings. So that's the broad, that's the immediate context. And we want to focus here in the patriarchal period, this man Abraham, who is an unbelievable believer. I hope you have found it by now. Follow along. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning now in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he left not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and as the innumerable grains of sand along the seashore. All these died in faith, 
without having received the promise, but having seen and welcomed from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country which they left, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and the one who had received the promises was offering up his only son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he had received him back as a type. Now, if you know much of the New Testament, then you know that Abraham punctuates the pages of the New Testament more than any other single Old Testament character. And we're not surprised because he is the father of the faithful. He is called the friend of God, and he's an example for us to follow. And what we find here in this portion of Scripture are four episodes from his life, and each episode is introduced with the by-faith formula. Notice in verse 8, you might want to circle the first two words, by faith. By faith, it says Abraham obeyed. In verse 9, it says by faith, he lived as a stranger. In verse 11, it says by faith, even Sarah. In verse 17, by faith, Abraham. Whenever you read the scripture, it's important that you pay attention not only to that which the Spirit of God selects, but that which he has omitted. There are many, many other things that God could have included in Abraham's life, but by design, the Spirit who gave us the Scriptures admitted much of that. And there was a reason because of what he wants to teach us here in Hebrews 11. So we need to ask, why does the Spirit of God select from these particular four episodes in Abraham's life? Well, we'll see the answer today. Starting in verse 8, he unfolds the adventure of faith, that incredible departure from Ur of Chaldee. In verse 9, we'll see the patience of faith, where he sojourns in the land for over 100 years. In verse 11, we're going to study the certainty of faith, as seen in the miracle birth as Isaac is born. And finally, in verse 17, the test of faith, as seen in the supreme sacrifice of Isaac. Now, if you're using your note-taking outline, as you can see, we want to begin with the adventure of faith. Verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he left, not knowing where he was going. You read that and say, what's the big deal? You know, Ur of Chaldee. He leaves that to go to Canaan. Ur, it's a place like Smyrna, South Carolina, population 45, a little podunk nothing town. Well, actually, archaeology has shed, especially in recent years, that was anything but the case. It had one of the largest libraries of the ancient world, untold scrolls. They had air-conditioned homes. It's interesting when you go to Israel, to places like Masada, you can see how without electricity, they air-conditioned their homes. Uh, they had schools that taught square roots and logarithms. It was no small place. It was in many ways the center of civil, civilization. So he's leaving his friends. He's leaving his family. He's leaving his business. He's leaving his home. Everything that has all the components of a secure, happy life. Now, the first component of his faith that I want to underscore is revealed here in verse 8, and that is his faith was rooted in the Word of God. Abraham's faith is rooted in the Word of God. We're told in verse 8, by faith Abraham when he was called. Abraham somehow heard the voice of God Almighty. The voice was audible, it was objective, it was specific. He doesn't hear some peal of thunder. He doesn't see some lightning bolt pointing him in some direction. He literally actually hears the Word of God. That's what makes him a man of faith. By faith... He responds to the Word of God, and the New Testament says, so then faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, please understand, God does not speak in an audible voice today, contrary to some Christian teachers who have big egos, not to mention a lot of false prophets. 
God speaks in even a more sure and certain way as Peter unfolds, and that is through his written word. And we don't have just snippets of the word of God. We have all 66 books of Holy Scripture. Now listen to how clear the original calling was. It's recorded for us in Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord came, or the Lord said to Abram, and you'll see as we go through these scriptures today, sometimes Lord is in all capitals, sometimes L is in a capital letter, small letter, O-R-D. Sometimes God is in all capitals, sometimes it's capital G-O-D. That's another 15 minutes in this message. Read the introduction to the New American Standard and will help you to think that through. But this is the sacred name of God, Yahweh. Now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So when Abraham's called, he responds immediately. Why? Because his faith is rooted in scripture. He doesn't delay, he doesn't debate, he goes. Secondly, I want you to see his faith was linked with obedience. So it's rooted in the word of God, but it results, it's linked with obedience. We read now in verse eight, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance. No strings attached. He's not trying to make some kind of deal. You know, sometimes Christians, especially unbelievers, but sometimes Christians will bargain with God. God, I'll go to church every Sunday for the next three months if you do such and such for me. Or God, I'll do anything you want if you will do so and so for me. No, faith is not making some kind of deal with God. Faith is responding to what God says in responding because of who he is. Now this word obeyed is actually two Greek words brought together. Akuo, to listen, hupa, to listen under. It refers to a chain of command. He is listening under, faith obeys. And there are two remarkable phrases here in verse eight that to me communicate volumes. Notice, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he left, phrase one, phrase two, not knowing where he was going. Now remember, he's not some upwardly mobile professional who can just pull up tent stakes and leave. He is a person who's been living in Ur of Chaldee his entire life. He's 75 years of age, thereabouts. There's no desert van lines. There's no U-Haul and adventure and moving. This is a real chore about what he's going to do. To top it off, he doesn't know where he's going, and he doesn't know how long he's going to be gone, and God doesn't even give the man directions. Can you imagine trying to explain that to your relatives, to your in-laws? Where are you moving to, Abraham? We have no idea. You're moving and you don't know where you're moving to? That's exactly right. Well, uh, do you know how long it will take you to get there? Don't have a clue. Do you know how long you'll be gone? No, I don't. Um, What do you think is going to happen when you get there? I don't really even know. I can tell you something, Abraham, you are going crazy. That's your problem. You've pumped, pump, pumped a, a, a tent peg in your mind. You're not thinking straight. But for Abraham, the God of heaven who created the stars and the moon and the sun, some of the very things they worshiped in Ur, don't ever paint Abraham as some idol worshiping king or leader who then was converted. He never did that, and that's a misrepresentation of Scripture. He's a man who responds to conscience. He's a man who responds to creation, and so God responds with him. He is a man of faith. And when God calls him, he simply obeys, he submits. Too often, we try to get other people to give us advice, or we ask them, well, what do you think about so-and-so? God says this in his word, what do you think about it? Abraham doesn't care what people think. He knows what God has said, and that is all that is important to him. Again, in verse one, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And then we read in verses 4 and 5 of Genesis 12. By the way, you might want to have your hand in Genesis and in Hebrews because we're going to burn a path between those two books. 
So Abram went away as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the people which they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham simply obeys. And there's a lesson here for us. Faith is more than understanding the will of God. It's more than just intellectual assent. It's more than being stirred emotionally. There's a volitional, willful decision that one must make. And by the way, his adventure in faith raises a thorny question concerning God's specific will. The general will of God is undebatable. If this is God's inspired, inerrant word, then we know what God says and we need to respond. But what about the specific will for your life? Does he want you to live in Beaufort or in Dallas? Does he want you to go to Clemson or does he want you to go to Auburn? How do you discern the specific will of God for your life? I remember as a relatively new Christian, I was a sophomore at Boston College, and I was mapping out my life as a young student in the School of Management studying accounting, which I received my degree in, and I'm mapping it out for five years, and there's all this internal conflict. There's no real peace. And I can remember as if it happened yesterday. I said, Lord, I, I give up. <laughs> Whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. And then God began to unfold his specific plan for my life. Suppose I were to tell you this morning that I have a piece of paper here in the pulpit with God's specific will for you. You say, well, that, that's fantastic, Pastor. Tell me about it. Well, I can tell you three aspects of his will. As Romans 12, 2 says, it is good, it is acceptable, and it is perfect. Now, unfortunately, sadly, today, we use some of these superlatives, and we use them so much, they've become diluted. You know, you go to sell a car. Well, what's it like? Oh, it's a, it's a good car. And you immediately ask, well, what's wrong with it? <laughs> you know, like you have to say, no, this is a fantastic car. Be one of the greatest cars you'll ever own. You'll be a man in your community if you buy this car. But actually, the word good here in Scripture is the same word that is used to modify God, that he is a good God, and so the will of God is as good as God himself is. In addition, we learn that not only is God's will good, it is acceptable. It's acceptable, not only in going forward, but in looking back. Sometimes in going forward, we, we look with a great sense of excitement, but sometimes we look back and... We have a sense of disappointment, sometimes even a sense of agony. But when you are in the center of God's will, obeying that which you know, then you can go forward in joy, and you will, in essence, test and prove that God's will is good, it is acceptable, and it is indeed perfect. You cannot add anything to it to make it better. You cannot take anything from it. You say, well, Pastor Carl, that piece of paper in the pulpit intrigues me. Show it to me. And so I open it up, and it's a blank piece of paper with one line at the bottom for your signature. And it's not until you are willing to sign your name unconditionally to what God will reveal to you in Scripture that you will find the specific will of God. When you obey what you know, when you will grow. When you obey what you know the will of God to be, God will show you the things that you may not know about and I meet a, a lot of Christians today who have just kind of a blah relationship with the Lord. They're not, exciting. They, 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 they're not excited about the things of God. I, I, when I wake up in the morning, I say, Lord, here I am. I'm available. I don't know what you have for me today, but I'm available. And God will unfold his will, not all at once. It's like driving down the highway with your headlights on. You don't need to see three miles down the road. You only need to see 300 yards down the road. You know, the wonderful thing is when you get down 300 yards, the, the next 300 yards is unfolded for you. 
So here's this man in verse eight, and the text says he left not knowing where he was going. No map, no GPS system, is like a blank sheet of paper, and he responds. And too many Christians today, they're trying to kick down closed doors, and what they need to do is simply obey what they know, and God will unfold his will. He will show you what is next. It is indeed an adventure in faith, and it is exciting. That's the first aspect of Abraham's faith. It was indeed an adventure. It's rooted in the word of God, and it is linked with obedience. Secondly, I want you to think with me about the patience of faith, the patience of faith. We are now told here in verse 9 of Hebrews 11, by faith, he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as, a foreign, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. So he's dwelling in Canaan, and it's a continual test. Here's a map just to help you to visualize. He's down here in the lower right-hand corner by the Persian Gulf, and there's this town. It's the center of civilization 2,000 years before Christ. It's called Ur of Chaldee. And his path is recorded in Scripture. He has to walk up and around the top of the Fertile Crescent. He comes to Haran, Haran, if you remember, his daddy got sick, and so he had to care and show respect to his dad, and he paused there for a period of time, and his dad died, and then he moved on. And he made his way down into Shechem. Usually, if you go to Israel, you don't go to Shechem, but I've been privileged to go there once, and it was the place where God then spoke to him and said, you've arrived. And when you're in Shechem, it, and if it's a clear day, you can see the whole land of Israel. It's just wonderful. Now, you could debate, did he go around this city to avoid maybe the people, or did he go this way? He walked a minimum of 1,500 miles. He walked a maximum of maybe 21, 2,200 miles. Even if he went 1,500 miles, that's halfway across the United States of America. And he goes not knowing where he is going. He patiently endures. And it's not until he gets there that he gets the next word from God. So there's two dimensions to this patience that I want you to see. First, his patience is seen in reference to his possessions. His patience is seen in reference to his possessions. Verse 9 says, By faith he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. So he's in the land that God promised him, but he's in that land, the text says here, as a foreigner. Now, let's face it, if you know your Bible, you know that Abraham never received one square inch of the land. In fact, when Stephen recalls Abraham's life, he says this in Acts chapter 7. And he said, hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. So this man lives his whole life without seeing the fulfillment of God's promise. In fact, according to Genesis 23, when Sarah dies, he has to negotiate with the people a place where he can bury her. Unlike Noah, who knew exactly what he was supposed to do, he knew precisely how he was to do it, and God had already told him the outcome. Abraham knew none of these things in terms of its fulfillment. He just continues in patience. In fact, when Nehemiah recalls Abraham, he makes this statement in Nehemiah 9. He said, you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. Now, the life of Abraham teaches me that walking by faith does not mean you have zero problems. No sooner does he get into the land, and the Bible writes that there was a severe famine. Listen to what's recorded in Genesis 12 and in verse 10. 
Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. How can you be in the center of God's will and have a famine? Very easy, it's all part of the divine process. James tells us, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let, here's the choice, and let endurance have its perfect result that you might be complete, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Don't bail out, don't quit, don't give up, continue on, in faith. And so, you know, we say, Lord, make me more like your son. Make me more like Jesus. And the next thing we know, there's some trial in our life. And we say, Lord, what happened? And God says, I'm simply answering your prayer. His patience is seen in reference to his possession. Secondly, his patience is seen in reference to his lack of permanence, to his lack of permanence. Now, don't miss the truth that God's highlighting here in verse 9 in that Abraham never permanently settles in the land. We read now in verse 9, by faith, he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now, notice he's referred to here as a stranger. Some of your translations say a sojourner. The old NAS says an alien. The Net Bible says a foreigner. All the time, he is in the promised land, He never digs down roots and builds a house. He lives in a tent. And as you follow Abraham's life, you discover he lived in four principal places, Shechem, Bethel, Hebron, and Bathsheba. He lived the life of a nomad wandering, but he did so as part of God's will for his life. We used to sing when I was a new Christian, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a mansion for me over there. It's an interesting play on words here that describes Abraham. It says that he lived as a stranger. You see that word live, it means to dwell alongside. It indicates not a permanent residence, but a temporary residence. And do you see that word living in the phrase living in tents? It's the same Greek word with a different preposition in front of it, and it means to settle down permanently. And the Spirit of God using a play on words is underscoring a critical truth. That is that he settled down in a tent permanently. That his permanent dwelling place was that of a tent. And in many ways, that should represent us. It's a picture of the relationship that we are to have. We're to mix it up with unbelievers. Jesus was a friend of sinners. We should care and pray for their souls that God would open their eyes as he did in his mercy and grace to open your eyes if you've received Jesus as Lord. The same time, we shouldn't live like the lost people of this world who live for this life only. Jesus taught the principle that you are to live in this world, but you are not to be of it. Paul expressed it this way to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 1. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Any person who tells you that when you die, your body, soul, and spirit are asleep in the ground waiting the resurrection, they don't understand Scripture. The only thing in Scripture that is described as sleeping is your body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians. That's why he says, for me to live is Christ. To die is not a loss. It would be if I had my fellowship with God put on hold. It's a gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. I am hard-pressed from both directions. Having the desire, notice, to depart and be with Christ... For that is very much better, yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now, the word depart, remember, Paul's a tent maker, and you will see in the New Testament that the various writers, the Spirit of God inspires them, but he uses their human personality. And so Paul has his own vocabulary that's different from Luke, who's a physician, and so forth. It's a word that literally means to pull up the stakes of a tent. Paul recognized that our home here, we're just like tent dwellers. One of these days, we're going to pull up stakes. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, 
We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Tents wear out. Some of you are showing your age, and when I see you, you say, will you pray for this ache and for this pain and this operation, and our tents wear out. This is a tent that we live in. But God has a building for us, eternal in the heavens. And so this is the perspective that Abraham had. He was willing to live his whole life in a tent. Why? Because he was looking beyond this life. Look at the first word in verse 10, for. It's a causal in Greek. It means because, as some English translations render, because he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So this word foundation is in contrast to the word tense in verse nine because it speaks of something that is permanent. And if you're using the NASB, which is a little more literal here, it doesn't say a city, but it says the city. The Greeks gave us the article. It appears some 20,000 times in the New Testament. And we enjoy it in English because it's the pointing words as we tell third graders. It points to something specific. And so who, he was looking for the city whose architect and builder is God. In Hebrews 12, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels. Or in Hebrews 13, we're told, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Don't miss the point that the spirit of God is trying to make for us. He was not simply looking for the land of Canaan, he was looking for a heavenly, heavenly city. He sees himself with the perspective that Peter tells us we are to see ourselves as aliens and strangers. We're just passing through. Our real home is in heaven. Now look, if God's given you something nice, Paul said to Timothy, God has given you all things to enjoy. But don't hold on to it too tight. If you are holding on to this life only, you are a junk collector. And when you die, your kids will know it. 60, 70 years of junk that they have to dispose of, much of which they don't want. And listen, we are to live not with the temporal, but with the permanent in view. Now that brings us to the third dimension, the third component of this man's faith, and it concerns the power of faith. The power of faith. Look, if you will, now at verse 11. By faith, even Sarah. You might want to circle in your Bible the word even because we're not speaking here only of Abraham's faith but also of Sarah's faith too. Even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him the Lord faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead as that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and as the innumerable grains of the sand along the seashore. Now remember, he's writing to Hebrew Christians who knew the Old Testament well, especially the first book, Berashit, in the beginning, that's what they named it on the scroll. We take it from the Greek Bible, Genosios, we call it Genesis. Turn to the book of Genesis. Again, we're gonna wear out a path here. You're in chapter 12 if you held your finger there. And look at verse two. I want you to see the incredible promise that God makes to Abraham when he's 75 years of age. He says, and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. Our government should listen to that because this past week they cursed Israel. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because through Abraham's loins will come Yeshua, the Savior of the world, who can save every tribe, tongue, and people. Well, about 10 years go by and nothing happens as Abraham and Sarah are still childless. Fast forward, Genesis 15. As you read the chronology carefully, you now discover that Abraham is 85 years of age. Notice how the chapter opens. After these things, after what things? After the war just described, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. 
And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born of my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Here he is, 85 years old. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And Abraham, 85, he said, that's wonderful, but I don't have any kids. He takes them outside said, can you see those stars? I think I've only seen a clear night once in my life. And I say that in retrospect because we were in the middle of Kansas, driving to a Bible school in my 72 Volkswagen, but it made it there, no air conditioning. And it was about midnight. We said, let's stop. And me and two other guys, and we laid our sleeping bags out under some farmer's field. And I've never seen before or since so many stars in my life. God gave him that kind of life, night. Start counting, Abraham. If you can count, so shall your descendants be. And then verse six says, then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, we just read in Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive. We've seen the faith of Abraham, but this time, he is underscoring the faith of Sarah. God had promised that through Abraham, he would become a father of many nations. And Sarah knew that. Sarah knew that somehow through Abraham, as God is unfolding his will, that this couple is going to be the couple that will ultimately start a new nation. Remember, they're kind of Gentiles at this point. And so God forms a new nation. They become Jews and that God is gonna give some parameters in terms of how they should live, what they should believe, who they should marry. And of course, Sarah knows this much, but she's getting a little bit uptight at this point. She said, Abe, you know, we're, we're not making too much progress here. We know it's not Eleazar, but it doesn't appear like I'm gonna have a baby. Maybe the Lord meant someone else. Let's go to plan B. Look at chapter 16. In verse 2 of Genesis, Genesis 16 and verse 2. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please have relations with my slave woman, Hagar. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And what a pack of trouble that decision caused. In fact, all the trouble in Israel today is a product of that decision. Ishmael ends up having 12 children, like Jacob had 12. They formed the 12 Arab nations of the world, and there's been great conflict ever since. Genesis 17 and verse 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai, which speaks of the majesty and the strength and the ability for God to supply abundantly. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between you, between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Avraham, or multitude of nations, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I have made you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Furthermore, notice verse 15, God tells Abraham, then Abraham, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, which means my princess, but you shall call her Sarah, which means 
Princess shall be her name. In other words, she's not simply your wife, she's not simply my princess, but she's going to be the princess of entire nations. I will bless her, and indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be called a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now many times, only Sarah is given the blame for having laughed. But the text is clear that they both laughed. On three different occasions, the laughter associated with Isaac's birth is unfolded. But unlike Sarah's laugh, which was a laugh of unbelief, Abraham's laugh was a laugh of astonishment, of amazement, of shock. And so he asked for clarification concerning Ishmael. Notice verse 9, 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife will bear you a son. Sarah will be the mother of Abraham. Sarah, your wife will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzhak, Isaac, that in Hebrew means laughter. Now, God has a different plan for Ishmael. Contrary to some people who say that Isaac went to heaven and Ishmael went to hell, and they misunderstand Romans 9, where it's not dealing with personal election, but choosing of different nations. The promise is not going to come through Ishmael's line, but through Isaac. And remember, Ishmael was brought up and raised under the father of the faithful, and you will meet him in heaven someday. As for Ishmael, verse 20, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So Abraham is moved by faith, and as a sign of the covenant that he believes God, he has everyone in his house circumcised, including himself. Now, it's clear from the broader context and from the immediate context and from commentary in the New Testament that his laugh is not a laugh of unbelief, but a laugh of amazement. And God gives us divine commentary in Romans chapter 4. Listen to these words. Paul records, without becoming weak in faith... He contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that he, God, had promised what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I'll turn the page again. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Go to Genesis chapter 18. And I want us to explore Sarah's laugh. And I want you to see first, as we consider the faith of the patriarchs, first a summary of Sarah's faith. Point A there on your outline, a summary of Sarah's faith. Three heavenly visitors come. Two are normal angels. One is called the angel of Yahweh or the angel of the Lord. And you will see in that chapter of Scripture and the one that follows, Lord is in all caps because this is no ordinary angel. The angel of the Lord only appears in the Old Testament. If you've taken my course on angelology, you know that he appears before Bethlehem. And when Bethlehem happens, you never see him again on the pages of Scripture. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. And that's why the angel of the Lord is called God in Scripture. Notice verse 9 of chapter 18. Then these three visitors, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, there in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening in at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. That's God's way of telling us it was hopeless from a human perspective. And so we read in verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself. Literally, the text says she laughed within. You've done that before. You've been in some setting. 
You feel like laughing out loud, but you bite your tongue to be polite, and you laugh within, and no one else knows you're laughing possibly but you. Now, that's Sarah. God just told Abraham that his 99-year-old wife was going to have a baby. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also, which, of course, complicates the problem. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Now, what's so interesting back here in Hebrews chapter 11 is that none of the elements of Sarah's unbelief are recorded. The writer under the leadership of the Spirit of God just passes over that. Why? Because he wants to underscore that Sarah recovered. Listen to Hebrews 11, 11. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life. In other words, her womb was as good as dead, and she had to be touched by God in order to have a baby. And how did she respond? In faith. That's why she got in the marriage bed with Abraham. She considered. It's a word that means she calculated. She considered him, God, faithful who had promised. So like all others in this chapter, she she chose to believe God's promise in spite of the circumstances. That's Sarah's faith. Now we have a summary of Abraham's faith. A summary of Abraham's faith beginning now in verse 12. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants. And notice the change in typeset. If you're new to the Bible, that means it's an Old Testament quotation. And if you have a Bible with cross references, you can look it up, and that will help you in the New Testament to understand the text. As many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and as the innumerable grains of sand along the seashore. So he chooses to believe God in spite of the circumstances. Both have no ability in themselves to have a child, but they both have a promise and they both believe it. They are assured that what God promised, he is able to do. They are convinced that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so a miracle baby comes. He is 100, she is 90 years old, respectively. And of course, If you read the rest of the story, you discover that she laughs again. And it's not a laugh of unbelief, it's a laugh of great joy when Yitzhak is born. And now that brings us to a summary of the patriarch's faith. Beyond the summary of Sarah's and Abraham's faith, there's again this brief interlude and we find a summary of the patriarch's faith. We read now in verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers in exiles on the earth. All these died in faith. The immediate context, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah. In the broader context, verse 39, includes all the men and women of faith mentioned in this chapter. They saw themselves how? As strangers and exiles. Why? Because they were convinced that their real home was not earth, but heaven. Verse 14, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country, which they left, they would have had opportunity to return. For instance, when Abraham leaves Ur of Chaldee, he says goodbye forever. Why? Because he's committed totally to the will of God. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. I love that. For he has prepared a city for them. What an epithet to put on a tombstone. For God to be able to sum up your life and say, God is not ashamed to be called your God. But I can tell you that will not happen if you are in love with this world. If you are living for the temporal, 
and not things of eternal value. Now, beyond the adventure of faith, this incredible journey from Ur of Chaldee, beyond the patience of faith, where he sojourns in the land for 100 years and never receives a stitch of it, and beyond the certainty of faith as seen in Isaac's miracle birth, that brings us finally to the test of faith. There is the test of faith, this unbelievable believer comes through flying colors when he is tested. And it's seen in the supreme sacrifice of Isaac. Look at verse 17 here in Hebrews 11. By faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Now I went with the NAS 95 because I think most people, when they memorize John 3, 16, memorize, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's the same Greek word, monogene. It's used five times in the New Testament of the Lord Jesus, and one other time in his shoes of Isaac. Now the cults will take this phrase, monogene, only begotten, to say that Jesus' life started in the sense that he was a created being, that he's not the eternal God. But you see, the term only begotten does not refer to birth alone in Scripture. And that becomes obvious when you read Abraham's life. Because if Isaac is called the only begotten son, what about Ishmael? He had a son named Ishmael as well. Not to mention after Sarah dies, he marries Keturah, and he has six more children. And so the term only begotten, monogone, means unique. Some translations render John 3, 16 a one of a kind. In other words, Isaac, like Jesus, is promised and he is miraculous. And so no Hebrew person should have any difficulty in believing in the virgin birth because every Jew is here today because of a miracle birth. Isaac alone is the son of promise. And so verse 18 says of this chapter, it was he, Isaac, to whom it was said, in Isaac or through Isaac, your descendants shall be called. So Abraham passes the test with flying colors such that verse 19 can record. He considered, again calculated, that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. It's not some emotional thing. Faith is built on the word of God, which makes me question it a little bit. I'm not being definitive here, so don't judge me. The revival that is supposed to be happening there in Kentucky, it makes me question it. One, because I don't see a clear rooting in scripture I see a lot of song, I see a lot of emotion, and I see this week invited people who are terribly deficient in their theology. And one guy whom all the students prayed over last week who led the laughing revival in Florida where people fainted on the floor, laughed and barked like dogs. I see more emotionalism. Now, I hope it's real. Time will show. So notice here, turn to Genesis 22. The sacrifice of Abraham is mentioned in three places in Scripture. Telescopically, it's mentioned in Romans 4 and in James chapter 2, but microscopically, where we find the original account here in Genesis 22. Look now, if you will, at the opening verse. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, your monogene, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Now, there are four truths that I want you to notice about Abraham's faith as it is tested. First, his faith is immediate. His faith is immediate. We see Abraham's immediate response here in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. He didn't postpone. 
He doesn't pace up and down the floor. He doesn't worry. He doesn't negotiate with God. There's no bargaining. There's no delay. There's no arguing. There's no rationalization. There's no running from God. There's no doubting. There's only obedience. Has God shown you something from his word that you are to do? Maybe some relationship that should be broken off. Maybe some job that needs to be quit. Maybe something that you are to do with your children. Abraham obeys immediately. Now verses four and five give us a second characteristic of Abraham's faith. Not only was it immediate, Abraham's faith was confident. His faith was confident. We read now in verses four and five. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance, underlined the words on the third day. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Now you ought to circle that first person plural pronoun we in verse five. Abraham's confidence is based on the word of God. He is saying, we will worship and we will return. The boy and I are going, the boy and I are coming back. And in the Hebrew text, that first person plural pronoun is shared in both verbs. In fact, some translations render it that way. The NIV 84 says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Or the LEB says, we will worship and we will return to you. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said to offer him up as a burnt offering to reduce him to ash and smoke. How is it that he can say to his servants, we will worship and we will return? Because Abraham by faith believed God and he knew that God would never contradict any promises he made. He had clung to the promise of Genesis 21, 12 through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. God had promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation through Isaac, and if Isaac is dead, how can he make him a great nation? There's only one way. He has to bring him back to life. He was sure as he walked up that mountain and as he offered Isaac on that altar that God was going to bring him up out of the smoke and ash. He knew that God cannot lie, that God keeps his promises, that his word is forever settled in heaven. How did he know that? Well, after all, he got Isaac from the deadness of Sarah's womb and from the deadness of his own body. Now, that didn't make the process any less painful. Gets emotional starting in verse 6. Notice, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Can you imagine? They're walking up that hill with the torch, the wood, the knife, knowing what is about to happen. By the way, don't get your theology from some coloring book that they give in some churches to children to fill in where Isaac's a little boy of eight or nine years of age. Nothing could be further from the truth. Genesis 23 indicates that Sarah died at 127, making Isaac 36 when she dies. Genesis 21, 34 said that that Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Not to mention, he is going to put wood on his back. You don't put wood on the back of a little boy. He is at least 20 years of age based on the chronology of Genesis. The Jewish people say in the Mishnah, he's 36 years of age. I won't be at all surprised when we get to heaven and find out he's 33 years of age. I've carried a lot of firewood, but not up a mountain. This is no little boy. Notice verse 27, my father. He said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine that? You've got a child, you've got a grandchild. Hey, dad, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, we've got the knife, but where's the offering? I mean, could anything be more heart-wrenching than that question? Now, there's a third dimension of Abraham's faith underscored in verse 8, and that his faith was based on God's character. His faith is based on God's character. Isaac had offered up many sacrifices with his father before. He knew the process, 
and he knew something was missing. So Abraham gives him the only answer he can give. Verse 8, and Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac just didn't know that he was a lamb. But Abraham's response was telling here and that he points his son to the unchanging faithfulness of God. And if you're going to raise your children for the Lord, then one, you need to soak your mind in Holy Scripture and you need to take the promises of God and point your children to those promises. His confidence was in God who provides and I cannot think of any better advice that you could give a young man. That brings us to the fourth characteristic of his faith and that is his faith was thorough. When it's tested, his faith was thorough. It was complete, we could say. Look now, if you will, at verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, if Isaac had any doubts before this as to what his father was up to, he knew precisely what was going to happen. He laid him on the wood bound. And there's no mention of any struggle. Remember, Abraham's an old man. Isaac is a young, strapping, 20-year-old plus. Could have easily overpowered him. But he is willing and ready under the leadership of his dad to give his own life. And don't make this just some calculated verse of a theologian trying to work things out on the pages of Scripture. This is a tender moment. I'm sure there were kisses, there were hugs, there were words of affection, words of understanding. This is a father who loves his daddy, and this is a daddy who loves his son. Verse 10, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And in Hebrews 11, God, by the Spirit of God, uses a Greek verb that describes a completed action, meaning it was settled. He had made up in his mind to take that raised knife and to put it through the chest of Isaac. This is no half-hearted. This is a thorough, completed faith. But God intervenes. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am, boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> no knife was more ready to be plunged or to be stayed, verse 12. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yahweh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Now, obviously, it is not by accident that the writer of the Hebrews describes Isaac as a type. Listen, it says, Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. If you're new to the Bible, a type is an Old Testament picture of the person or work of Christ and what God is going to do centuries later, millennial later in some cases, in the future. Isaac is a picture, and if two people ever revealed Jesus Christ, it was Abraham and Isaac there on Mount Moriah. And if you've studied this passage with me before, I've gone through in great depth the typology. Here is Isaac. He is a miracle baby. He is born when it's impossible for a son to be born. Here is the Lord Jesus, a miracle baby, born of a woman without a man. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a child, and his name will be called Mighty God. Here is Isaac carrying the wood up on his back as Christ carries the wood of the cross up on his back to Mount Moriah. 1 Peter 2.24 literally reads, He himself bore our body, bore our sins in his body on the wood. Some of your translations say on the tree or on the cross, but literally it reads on the wood. 
The fire would consume the wood just like God would judge his own son as he carried that cross up to Golgotha. And Isaac, he willingly laid down his life. Even so, the Lord Jesus, in the arrest scene, he puts a thousand plus men on their backs. And he had prophesied two weeks earlier to his men, no one has taken my life away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have a power to lay it down. I have authority to take it back up again. This is the commandment I've received from my father. And where was this execution to take place? On Mount Moriah. The place where David stayed the plague. The place where the angel of God came to Solomon and said, that place where David stayed the plague, that's where I want you to build the temple. Technically, the Hebrew says, on the mountains of Moriah. And if you keep traveling up outside the gate where the Messiah would be crucified, as seen in Old Testament typology, is Golgotha, where Jesus bled on a cross. And of course, what happens when he is ready to plunge the knife? God provides there in the thicket a ram, a substitute. His head is caught in thorns. Just as the Lord Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head for us. And if you pick it up in verse 4, he told his servants it was a three days journey. Why does God include that? Because in Abraham's mind, from the time they left, he was as good as dead. And Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. And on the third day, according to the scriptures, the Bible says he was raised from the dead. And do you know the next time when we see Isaac, he just disappears from the pages of scripture for a while. The next time we see him is when he is receiving a bride. And our Savior has gone to prepare a place. And the next time we will see him is when he comes back for his bride, the church. Friends, no man could have thought this up. You are reading this morning the very words of God. You say, Pastor, do you think Abraham understood this? Of course I do. He's called a prophet in the book of Genesis. And Peter says in Acts, every prophet preached Messiah. That would include Abraham. Not to mention, Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, if you've never been saved, if you don't have the assurance that this, if it were your last day that you would be in heaven, today is the day of salvation. When you hear the message of Scripture, the Bible says, don't harden your heart. Don't put God off. Because every time you say later, maybe, or no, you've made your heart a little bit harder and there will come a point where you cannot believe. Jesus said that in the parable of the sower where the devil is given permission to snatch the seed that is planted. Why? So that they may not believe and be saved. You don't have the promise that you'll be alive next week or that Jesus will come back. Today is the day. Receive him. And he will forgive you of everything you've ever done. And he'll give you a birth from above. And your life will change from the inside out. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed this morning. Maybe you're here. I want to invite you to receive Christ as your Lord if you've never done that. Maybe you're in Grays or Graniteville or live streaming somewhere in the world. Remember, God says, whosoever will may come. He said, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's speaking of Jesus. You call on Lord Jesus and he'll save you today. He came into the world to save sinners. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You cannot save yourself by being good enough. That's why he died. Would you say this morning, Lord Jesus, save me. Our Father, you have given us as believers a possession. You call it a treasure. It's a stewardship of the gospel. May we be faithful to it. May we look for opportunities that you would entrust to us. Even this week, for some people who might come on our campus on Friday night and later visit, 
Help us to be good stewards of the gospel. You've commissioned us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. A commission, your word says, is not just for preachers and evangelists and missionaries, but every blood-bought, born-again child of God. So help us corporately and individually to be faithful with the gospel message we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? I want to invite you as we sing a hymn of invitation to leave your seat and to come forward this morning. Maybe in recent days, maybe a minute ago, you said, Lord Jesus, save me. God would say, make it public. He says, if it's real on the inside, you go public with it on the outside. Maybe you need to be baptized. We just saw we baptized five relatively new believers today. Maybe you've never been baptized as an emblem of your faith. That's an act of obedience. By faith, you obey what God says. As you obey what you know, you grow. You may be here, you're saved and baptized, but you need a church home. If we can be that church, we invite you. So Matt's going to lead us. Step out now and meet me here in the front. Sing together.